everybody, my name is Dr. Raghav Sharmagaratan. I am a gynecological oncologist and we attached, I'm attached to Asuntha Hospital at uh, the present time. We still do a fair bit of cases in the government hospitals as well as other private centres. But essentially, uh, we deal with a lot of cancer patients and, and mainly, of course not mainly, essentially just women alone. So we're going to talk today about gynecological cancers and uh, what we are facing, what we can do for them. But more importantly, how do we pick patients up early? How do we talk to patients about their risk factors and how they can deal with it at a point where treatment is going to be the most effective? Uh, sometimes, in the majority of the cases, we are picking up patients fairly late in their diagnosis and sometimes the managements that we can offer them are limited in their response. And that's the biggest concern that we have. So the first question that I would ask anybody as we go along is why are we treating these conditions? We don't want to be treating patients who have who present with uh, tumors like this, especially in ovarian cancer where the tumors have already uh, become bigger, they've already started spreading or metastasizing, and the difficulty in uh, surgical resection and adjuvant treatment uh, becomes more evident. This is another case where a patient has a rupture in the tumour right here and this results in dissemination of the tumour cells within the abdominal cavity. Now, we do have principles of management. Unfortunately, as the stage advances, the management becomes less and less effective and that's the biggest concern that we have. In uterine cancers, we do get patients who have uh, tumours actually invading the entire endometrial cavity as well as into the myometrium and in worst case scenarios beyond the interest as well. And of course in some cases where we have cervical growths resulting in tumours actually invading the cervix, the vagina and the upper uterus as well. We can treat them. Our, unfortunately the responses that we get are not as good as if we would if we could treat them much much earlier, especially in the pre malignant stage. So what I'd like to focus on today is rather than just the knowledge of treating cancers is how do we pick them up before they become more advanced, number one. And number two, perhaps even identifying the patients at risk so that they are able to actually get to a point or get to a reference point where they can be treated and they can be picked up at a much, much earlier stage. We would prefer certainly treating ovarian tumor which is benign a cervical intraepithelial lesion as opposed to an absolute cancer and, and with these kind of treatments usually the results are very good the patient's prognosis is excellent and uh, we are able to give them a good quality of life as they go on enjoy so first we want to talk about uh, sorry we want to talk to you about the burden that we face and this is the south east asian burden of cancer and if you notice overall in southeast asia the cervical cancer is probably the second most common. Now we're talking about countries where uh, a proper screening program is not in place or there are other difficulties uh, leading to an uh, abnormal or suboptimal psychological assessment. If you notice, breast cancer still is number one. This is across the world. There is no way we're going to move away from that. But the beauty of most of the women's cancers is that they can be picked up at, early, at an early stage if knowledge, education and empowerment is in place. We also start seeing ovarian cancers and endometrial cancers actually starting to rise up as we grow older. Our older population certainly is at a greater risk of uh, developing cancers as we age. The Malaysian burden, if you notice, the cervical cancer has dropped to the third. Now, in a developed countries, if you're talking about countries like the UK, Australia, US, and all, we'll see that cervical cancer has dropped down to probably number eight or nine down the list. And that's because of an excellent vaccination program, an excellent screening program, and a proper referral system, which is something that we should strive for, I think, in the future. And we will see the, the decrease in the incidence of cervical cancer. But as we grow older, we're going to start seeing an increase in the ovarian cancer rates. We're going to see an increase in the uterine cancer rates. There are other gynecological cancers which are much less common. And uh, unfortunately, that because they're not as common, it becomes difficult to actually screen patients for them or even to, uh, to diagnose patients having these cancers. And the cancers that I'm talking about, fallopian tube cancers, 
primary peritoneal tube cancers. So, mortality rates, we're just talking about the incidence of the disease, but what about mortality rates? One of the concerns we have is the failure of treatment or the, the uh, difficulties that we face in actually affording or offering patient cure. And if you look at it, breast cancer and uh, still contributes to a substantial mortality rate in Southeast Asia and indeed in Malaysia as well. But when you're looking at really high rates of uh, demise, we're looking at lung cancers as the main culprit. And of course, you get a very gray area of multiple different types of cancers, right? So we are in a position where we do see mortality rates dropping because of the early diagnosis, because of the advancement in treatment, but not at a pace which we would like. Certainly, advancements of treatment is helping, but you know, it does uh, have limitations in its access, limitations in its cost, finances, as well as limitations in its uh, availability to, to patients. Now, when we talk about management principles, I'm going to just be very brief about it. Let's talk about ovarian cancer. I think the first difficulty in management is the diagnosis and the convincing of the patients that they do have a tumor which is well as um, uh, assumed to be malignant, but sometimes patients have difficulty accepting it in the first step and saying, you know, what if it's benign, why should I do something, shouldn't I do something, why didn't I pick it up, why weren't I having symptoms? And that's the most difficult part, to tell the patients to actually move forward and say, look, we can't change time. The, the tumors are there, the growths are there, we don't know whether it's benign, but we would like to certainly find out and offer a proper treatment. So, with ovarian cancer, management principle essentially comes down to a proper resection. To leave as little tumour as possible following the, the tumour debarking. So if you can limit to residual tumour being less than 1 cm in total, the patient's outcome is usually very good. Of course, following the, the staging of the disease, we would also uh, talk to them about management chemotherapy, the use of anti-angiogenic drugs like Avastin, and certainly targeted treatments like Olaparibinol, which is, which is, you know, it's coming into the, into uh, or making a very important step forward for especially disease-free or symptom-free disease. Unfortunately, if you're looking overall at survival rates, the benefits are still fairly limited. However, we still would like to offer patients the best uh, treatment possible. Finding a patient who is ha having a stage 1 disease with a histology that is not so aggressive is probably the best prognosis. However, we do know that the younger the patients are, the more difficult we're going to get these patients. We're going to actually get patients with advanced tumors, with more aggressive tumors. Now, with cervical cancer, once again, I, I, I'd like to point out here, we don't want to treat cervical cancers. We want to treat pre-cancers. The treatment of pre-cancers is usually 100% effective, and the treatment of actual cancers, uh, they, they do include a radical surgery depending on the stage followed by radiotherapy and chemotherapy, which in itself causes a lot of distress, a lot of side effects, a lot of complications. So patients are really looking at that, worrying about the complication and side effects as opposed to actually going through the proper treatment. And that's the concern we have. So trying to tell a patient, look, you are at a risk of developing cervical cancer. We found it very early. We have a simple procedure which can offer you 100% cure. However, you do require follow-up. Is is, is something that we prefer to do as opposed to telling the patient, look, you've got cancer, we've got to do a very major surgery uh, from which you may have certain complications which includes lower limb lymphedema, which includes possibility of having radiation and chemotherapy which may lead to other side effects. That's more difficult. That's more difficult for us to get a patient to agree to that. And of course, endometrial cancers, I put it at the bottom because it carries the best prognosis. Majority of the patients who have type 1 endometrial cancer, which I'll explain after this, uh, they do actually recover very well, especially if you get it at a very early stage. And in many cases, a surgery is more than enough. You don't actually have to do uh, radical radiotherapy and all those things. But having said that, we are also able to determine or to, 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 to hope that a patient actually has a hypoplastic change, a precancerous change of the endometrium. So it's important for us to recognize signs and symptoms that the patient present to it in the hope that we can actually get to these patients before they develop endometrial cancer, before they are requiring a much more advanced care. So all of these scans, will, all these management pro uh, processes will be done by a gynecological oncologist in a major hospital. 
And one of the things that is very important is the fact that we need to refer these patients quickly. They need to be very clear about what they are having and why the treatment plan is, is going as, is this as such and what we can offer them in the long term. So, to get to this point, what do we have to do? We have to screen. Now, what is screening? A simple way of talking about screening is an organized and quality assured program which picks up the patients at risk, not necessarily, sorry, not necessarily picking up the patient who is having the disease, but certainly who is at risk. One of the reasons why screening is, is, is not as uh, widespread as we'd like it to be is the fact that there are competing health needs. For instance, right now influenza, coronavirus and all those things in the 80s, the HIV uh, infections, so on and so forth. So they do have competing requirements. So finances are, tend to be uh, geared towards or, or uh, sort of pushed towards the greater need. Certainly, human and financial uh, resources poorly developed screening programs, women who are not empowered to actually seek treatment and seek care, seek screenings, war, uh, widespread poverty and of course the nature of the screening test. Now, being a gynecologist, being a male gynecologist, we do have patients who are a little bit you know, apprehensive about seeing a male gynecologist or even seeing a gynecologist because it does involve a very sensitive area of the body. One of the things is making these patients very comfortable with you and, and making them understanding that making them understand that this is necessary and usually in my experience that once the patient understands they are very open to any of the procedures that you, you would advise them to, to uh, uh, take up so once you are able to screen and once you are able to identify patients at risk you can then offer them prevention so we divide prevention into secondary prevention and primary prevention Secondary prevention is knowing that there's a possible cause, however not being able to do anything about the cause, but being able to do something about identifying the consequence of the cause, which is progression of a, uh, of a, of a disease which may result in a cancerous change. So this is what we're, it's, it's we're talking about when we talk about secondary prevention. Once again, identifying the population at risk, who is going to actually receive the screening procedure, Make it as comfortable, as optimal, as cheap, as financially uh, viable as possible. Having a referral base to know that, uh, or in, in place so that the patient has a place to go to once they are diagnosed with these screening issues or with this uh, possible uh, disease. And the places of referral should include patients who can, uh, places that can offer adequate therapeutic management. And of course, we must understand that every patient is an individual and a, and, and a follow-up regime as well as a treatment regime should be as practical to that patient as possible. So we do not treat patients as a disease. We treat the disease when, when the patient comes to us and we teach, treat the patients as an individual. So we're going to go on to what is going to become a very common cancer in the future. As we age, as our population, population ages, we're going to go and see more and more patients coming in with endometrial cancer. Unfortunately, with endometrial cancers, there's no uh, uh, formal screening test. So a lot of it has got to do with awareness of risk and symptoms. And awareness that they do have to seek treatment or seek some degree of assessment uh, for these symptoms. It is fairly common. Malaysia, we see 5.26 cases for every 100,000 women. And if you look at Singapore, they are much higher. So this is strange in the sense that uh, the numbers vary greatly in such a such a, sort of a close uh, region. The main reason is the women there are seeking more care. The women there are older, and they are actually going to be at more more at a risk of developing uh, cancers as well. However, the mortality rate is reasonably quite low, despite an incident rate of high, quite uh, of being, uh, sorry a fairly high incidence rate. The reason is treatment modalities are effective if we pick these patients up very early. And that is what I'd like to focus on. That's what I'd like to, 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 to emphasize upon. The fact that if you do pick them up early, they stand far better chance. So disregarding symptoms is probably not the best idea to go. Understanding that the patient has come with a symptom that's bothering her and identifying the right person to see uh, and, and the person who, who is going to offer the best uh, diagnostic procedure. So we'd like to divide endometrial cancer into two types, type 1, 
and of course type 2. Now type 1 cancers have a better prognosis. They tend to appear much later in life. They are uh, environmental, uh, due to environmental reasons, mainly being an un unopposed estrogen uh, exposure. Whereas type 2, we tend to see them much earlier in life and you're looking at the 30th and the, uh, in the 30s and the 40s and they tend to be genetically linked. The problem with genetically linked tumors is that they are aggressive in nature and uh, the histology types, uh, the histological uh, types that we get tend to result in very quick metastatic deposits. So what are the risks that we are facing? So it's called peripheral conversion and this increases the risk of exposure of the endometrium to uh, the estrogens itself. The use of tamoxifen because of breast cancer, that leads to uh, an increased estrogen receptor uh, uh, sort of a stimulation of the estrogen receptors within the uterus as opposed to uh, inhibition in the breast. It leads to an increased risk of hypoplastic changes along with cancer changes as well. The use of HRT especially a uh, single agent in a patient that retains the uterus increases the risk and of course a family history of endometrial cancer. We do know now there's a genetic link to endometrial cancer especially with patients who have colorectal cancers, lung cancers, liver cancers. We have something called a HNPCC or a Lynch syndrome which increases this risk. Now I'm not emphasizing on the other points but I'm certain, certain the society will be able to uh, provide the slides and information to you as we go along. So once again Excess weight seems to be playing a huge role and it is playing a huge role in many other diseases as well. Along with certain diseases comes a long uh, cancers change especially when it's an inflammatory disease. Right? So in for type 1 uh, disease, type 1 endometrial cancer, what are the common sources of estrogen? Number one is unopposed estrogen in HRT. And tamoxifen is the second most common cause of endometrial changes in type 1. But the good thing about these tumors are they are or they tend to be very, very uh, passive. They don't actually metastasize too quickly. And the symptoms are sufficient enough to pick up, for us to pick up stage 1 disease, stage 2 disease. So it carries a very a decent prognosis. Okay. So what are the endogenous sources? What are the sources of estrogen within ourselves, within our body that actually causes this? Obesity, as I said, number one. And ovulatory cycle. So patients who are having difficulty in producing eggs during your ovulation, especially in patients with PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, patients who are diabetic, patients who have irregular periods with prolonged intermenstrual uh, periods, these are patients who in the long term will have a slightly higher risk of uh, developing endometrial cancers. And of course, they go hand in hand with ovarian cancers which secrete estrogen such as granulosa cell tumors. So it's not always a singly occurring endometrial cancer. We do have synchronous tumors and you have to be a little bit worried with patients, the postmenopausal patients who have an ovarian tumor which suddenly started bleeding. However, once again, if that's the case, usually the prognosis is quite uh, quite. So what are the risk factors once again that, that you would want to ask a patient who comes in with the symptoms? Familial predisposition, that means the patient's fami familial risk. History of Lynch syndrome, patients who have history of uh, colon cancer, lung cancer, liver cancers in the family and as high as 43% of women are affected. So if you can do a genetic assessment and we can identify Lynch syndrome in some of the patients, there is sense in actually offering uh, a patient a uh, prophylactic history, which is unfortunately, uh, I think, the future. It, there's, not much evidence to suggest an ovarian tumor resulting in or, or having a BRCA1 and 2 gene uh, sorry, uh, issue actually having an increased risk of endometrial cancer but that is being proposed. So they're looking at BRCA1 and 2 not only for breast and ovarian but it's linked with endometrial cancers as well. So symptoms, certainly the simplest thing is heavy pain, right? Do not underestimate the significance of heavy pain. 
it's not just a hormonal imbalance, especially for the younger women who've been having very regular periods, who have lost weight and suddenly having heavy weight, you would want to pay a little bit of attention. Certainly postmenopausal bleeding, without a doubt, an endometrial sampling is required. Whether it's by a pickle sampling in the outpatient clinic or a hysteroscopic assessment, that's, that's important. The rest of the symptoms tend to be quite vague and they tend to be across the board with most gynecological uh, issues. Dysuria, pain, uh, weight loss, yeah. Now, a lot of patients have come to me with having been diagnosed with endometrial cancer who told me, you know, look, I don't have, I had a pap smear and everything was normal. I think we must emphasize to them that a pap smear was, was initially, funnily, initially planned uh, for assessing endometrial cancers, but in the long run, after they looked at, initially, after they looked at how the responses came back, how the results came back, they realized that it's actually not very good for looking at endometrial cancers, it's almost certainly and exclusively looking at the possibility of survival cancer. One of the things in a pap smear which, which comes back, uh, which you can use as a, as, as a guide, is the result, is the, uh, sorry, is the presence of endometrial cells in any woman above 40 years. So when a woman turns 40 and you do your pap smears, and in the pap smears you've seen endometrial cells, the patient requires a hysteroscopic assessment because there is a small indication in a pap smear which may indicate a hypoplastic change within the uterine cavity or indeed a survival cancer, uh, sorry, an endometrial cancer uh, change. So the commonest uh, steps that we do or the commonest uh, examinations that we do as a transvaginal ultrasound mainly looking for the endometrial line just here. We have a set or we have a guideline about the thickness. It's not an absolute but anything beyond between 0.4 centimeters to about 0.6 centimeters is about normal. Anything above that tends to be a little bit more worried, especially in a postmenopausal woman. If it's above 0.6 centimeters, you would want her to actually have an assessment done. The second step, and perhaps the gold standard of assessing an endometrial uh, complication, is certainly uh, a hysteroscopic assessment. Now, a hysteroscopic assessment is a visual assessment of the uterus or the uterine cavity, at which point of time a biopsy can be taken so as to confirm the diagnosis. So, so once the diagnosis has apologized, once the diagnosis has actually been done, the patients can be referred to a gynecological center, a gynecological and oncology center, uh, at which point in time the histology will be reviewed and of course the CT scan, radiology, imaging will be done to uh, sort of determine the possibility, the possible staging and a treatment plan to be placed. Majority of the treatment plans with endometrial cancers include a surgical resection of the uterus. If, if the cervix is involved, we do consider a radical hysterectomy, a pelvic lymphadenectomy, uh, and depending on the histology, we would even uh, advise the patient to have a nomentectomy as well as a periodic uh, lymphadenectomy. So the surgical resection is necessary, following which the histology will tell us the, like, the, the staging, and upon that, we will decide whether radiology, sorry, radiotherapy or uh, chemotherapy would be necessary. Now, what about ovarian cancer? The single most important thing that I'd like to emphasize is there's no screening method. It's been assessed over the years and many, many tests have come up and, and uh, been proposed as a, as, a, as a screening method. However, right up to today, there is no evidence that screening for ovarian cancer makes any difference. In fact, the biggest study from the, from the uh, American College of Physicians suggested that you have to treat 100,000 benign cases to actually prevent one patient actually uh, from having ovarian cancer. So it doesn't make financial uh, sense, it doesn't make sense in the terms of the uh, human resources that is required to do all those things. Once again, awareness of risk, signs and symptoms, and of course the reference point to a, patient, to a, to a center that can actually make a proper diagnosis. So ovarian cancer in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, is 7.84, so slightly higher than endometrial cancer to 100,000 women. So it's slightly higher. And along with that, once again, uh, sorry, I really can't see this, but it's about 9.2% in Singapore. And we do see a higher, uh, a slightly lesser uh, incidence uh, in Singapore and all that because patients are being diagnosed much. Uh, the patients are probably not having 
or, or being seen in the gynecologist much, much earlier and cysts which are being managed, which could eventually turn malignant, are being dealt with at a much earlier uh, rate. This is the scary part. Though. The mortality rate from ovarian cancer far exceeds endometrial cancer. As I say, it's easier to treat endometrial cancer patients as opposed to treating uh, ovarian cancer patients. Out of the 7.94, we're seeing 4.34% of the patients are actually not surviving. And that same incidence is uh, reflected in Singapore as well. One of the concerns we have, or one of the, the, the main reasons for this, is that we are seeing these patients, majority of them, at stage 3, stage 4 disease, where response to treatment is not as good as the early stages. The younger the patients, once again, the more uh, aggressive the histology, the more likelihood of metastatic uh, disease and unfortunately once that happens the, the likelihood of cure is, is possibly much less. And the main concern is the, the fact that we do not know the natural history of ovarian cancer. For instance, with endometrial cancer and cervical cancer we know what possibly causes it, what steps they take, how they progress on from a non-cancerous state to a cancer state. With an ovarian tumor we don't know that. We don't have a well-defined precursor lesion. That means we don't have a starting point at which point we can diagnose the possibility of uh, a benign mass becoming malignant. We also don't know how long it takes for that thing to happen. We know with cervical cancer it takes a good 10 years prior to, uh, from a normal cell to actually uh, turning into cancer. But with ovarian tumors, we just don't have that information. We have multiple steps which are put in place, multiple uh, advice being given, but how effective they are still, you know, that, that's still up in the air. So one of the things that we have to worry about is risk factors. One of the things that we need to know about is risk factors. Once again, 10% of epithelial ovarian cancers are familiar, which means genetically predisposed. And we do have the breast ovarian cancer syndrome, which is the BRCA uh, disease. Spike site specific ovarian syndrome, as ovarian cancer such as endometrio endometriosis leading to clear cell cancers in the presence of hypercalcemia. Uh, we do have cancer family syndrome such as Lynch uh, type 2, which includes, as I said earlier, lung cancer, colon cancer, and things like that. Certainly, with the, uh, with the diagnosis of BRCA1 suppressor genes, we are now sort of uh, identifying patients who have to have regular checkups. And indeed, in some patients where there's a strong family history of cancers already occurring, we do tend to talk to them about what they want uh, to face in the future. We all know about Angela Jolie who actually had a mastectomy and a hysterectomy done as a precaution. In a lot of developed countries, that's actually the step that's being put in place. You know, after a genetic assessment, a counseling session is done and patients do come in for a prophylactic hysterectomy. So, one of the protective factors against ovarian cancer is the fact that multiparity. Having more children tends to reduce your risk of uh, having cancer, so ovarian cancer. So, first pregnancy, hopefully before the age of 30. There's evidence that oral contraception use reduces the risk, and five years of use reduces the risk by nearly half. And uh, a tubal ligations, funnily, everybody is saying, oh, if you have a tubal ligation, you have other diseases and all that. But we do know now that tubal ligation, in fact, the tubectomy reduces the risk of developing fallopian tube cancer, certainly, primary peritoneal cancers, definitely, and to a certain extent, ovarian cancers as well. Now, when we talk about hysterectomy, it's not, I'm not going to turn around and say, well, every woman, once she finishes her family, should have a hysterectomy. But certainly, if you do have a high risk and it's genetically confirmed that that's the case, that is possibly a step that can be considered. Lactation, sorry. That helps. And of course, bilateral ophorectomy and all that. Obviously, if you take out the sauce, you're not going to have the disease. Right? But once again, it becomes very important or very difficult for us to talk to patients, tell them this is the reason why we're doing this, this is the reason why we're doing that. Um, we are in a society where all this comes into play and all this is important uh, for women to, to, to decide whether they are comfortable with that kind of approach. Why is screening difficult? Once again, the ovary does tend to move, it can be above the uterus, can be behind the uterus, can be by the side of the uterus, right next to a sigmoid colon, especially on the left side. If it's fecal, uh, if, if there's some fecal matter, it's difficult to provide ultrasound. We don't know when to test. We, the, the prevalence or the incidence is low enough uh, that we actually have to test many, 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 many people before it comes down to one person who's at 
We do use a color flow doctor to look at the increased blood flow to ensure that, the, or to, to determine whether or not the ovary is getting increased blood flow, which suggests some changes within the ovarian uh, tissue. A CA125, which I'm sure everybody is uh, aware of. And certainly other tumor markers which come into play when you're doing a general checkup, which includes CEA, CA99, as well as the HE4 tumor marker. So a combination, as of now, a combination of the HE4 CA125 and a CA125 and a ultrasound seems to be the most uh, widely used and reasonably decent pickup. Yeah. So, of course, with ultrasound, we would advise a transvaginal ultrasound, which carries a much better specificity. CA125 is the most widely used uh, tumor marker. However, the next, the next slide is going to show you uh, how sometimes uh, undependable it can be. Because CA125 is raised in many, many conditions. And among them are malignant conditions, for instance, cervical, can cervical cancer with lymph node involvement in animal carcinoma subtype, fallopian tube, which, which behaves like ovarian. Endometrial, depending on subtype, pancreatic, colon, breast, the, uh, the lymphoma, mesotheliomas, even the lung cancers. But that's not the thing. You know, if you were to know that the patient has malignancy and a tumor marker is elevated, the patient is going to accept that. But if you don't know whether the patient has a malignancy and a CA125 is elevated, you also have be nine conditions which result in a CA125 being elevated. So, it is a very scary thought that I have a blood test that's that shows me or a tumor marker that is elevated, uh, but I don't know whether there's cancer or not. And then you go through the whole rigmarole of actually trying to diagnose it. Because knowing that there are benign cases or benign conditions which cause it. So I think with a CA125, you need to be very judicious in what you offer the patient and be very fastidious in diagnosing and deciding that this is indeed something that you want to do to, uh, uh, to for the patient. So the, uh, the steps that you want to put in place to achieve diagnosis condition before you decide on the treatment and further. And of course, with the, as once again, with the screening uh, process, the American Cancer Society, the American College of Obstetrician, the American College of Physicians clearly say there is no recommendation for a proper screening program. I think the most important thing is to understand that you do have to uh, assess the patient's risk before you actually advise them to go through any of these screening procedures. So where do we go? We still use the transvaginal scan, uh, scan as our primary screening method. We do have a combined multimodal strategy, strategy including tumor markers and TBS and of course there's uh, phospholipid uh, with, with uh, mitogenic and growth factor like actions, LPA, which is in the process of being assessed as a more sensitive uh, tumor marker, especially in early stages, because 50% of stage 1 disease do not have elevated CA125. Elevated CA125 tend to be because of irritation of the peritoneum, because of, a, of a, an advanced tumor. So I think we need to understand what the CA125 means to us. So screening guidelines, once again, assessment of patients risk. So women with presumed hereditary cancer syndrome should have. That means patients who have family history, patients who possibly have a genetic assessment, Patients who are uh, who have very close relatives, first degree, secondary relatives who have breast cancer, ovarian cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, they are the patients who should consider uh, who should have uh, a screening assessment. Yeah. Now we go on to cervical cancer. These are three names that you have to actually. That is very important. Peppermint Lewis, the pap smear is named after him, but he made a mistake. He thought it was for endometrial cancer. Herbert Trump is the gentleman who actually went through the test, the psychologist who went through the uh, test and, and told him this is not for endometrial cancer, it's actually being more, it's more effective for cervical cancer. Right. And Harold Lawson, who actually diagnosed the HPV virus and who oh, actually uh, sort of gave us the information that HPV virus is the cause. Okay. So once again, cervical cancer rates very high in countries where the screening programs are not in place very low in places that are, have a very good screening program and Malaysia we have literally in between. We only screen 23 to 25 percent of our women and that's unfortunate. Mortality rates, with a good screening program you get very low mortality rates, with a poor screening program unfortunately you get high mortality rates, once again due to the advanced nature of the disease. 
So treatment of disease. So when it comes to sorry, I'll go back to it. when it comes to cervical cancer. Once again, depending on the stage, one two. A surgery is something that can be offered. Radiotherapy and chemotherapy tends to be the mainstay in cancer, survival cancer to be on this next stage. Secondary prevention, as I said, identifying the group at risk, offer them a screening, uh, proper screening procedure which can result in us picking up patients very much earlier in the disease and, offer, and then moving them towards a treatment process which is more effective. But this is where the next step in evolution of treatment is, the primary prevention. The fact that we know, the fact that we identify the cause and the fact that we can do something about the cause makes it so much better. And we do see a drop in the cervical cancer rates because of this. So screening methods, basically you know, pap smears, uh, uh, visual inspection in countries where there's not much screening, pro there's not a, a formal screening program, visual inspections, um, corposcopy and advanced visual inspection, HPV DNA testing which is now coming into the fall as the, the best prognostic uh, uh, test as to whether or not the patient is going to actually have uh, cervical cancer. Polar probe is in its, in its assessment which is too expensive to be uh, taken into consideration. I'll go to the next slide. We are using what's called the Ventista system which is now the unit, it's, it's a very, it's the main uh, reporting system that's used across the world so that we have conformity in responses or results across the world. Different countries have different screen, have different reporting mechanisms, and we didn't know which one meant which, which, uh, which was actually uh, which corresponded to the other. So Bethesda has come up with their main system, which everybody knows. We do have screening; it's been here from the 1960s, and we know that when you actually screen, your risk of cancer actually drops. And when the screening went up in the 80s in the UK, the actual incidence of cervical cancer drops. So it's if it is effective. We have improved in our screening techniques in the sense we are now using liquid-based cytology which is much more accurate and, and uh, of course we are also looking at the HPV testing and capture which is the next evolution. A combination of HPV testing and liquid-based gives us the best result and it gives us a wider or a longer duration in between two screens. The, the US is actually testing on a five year screening uh, interval and uh, well, seems, uh, it, it, it seems to be the future. So corposcopy is a very close assessment. We look at surface changes to tell us whether there's a possibility of precancerous change or even cancerous change, which means we can biopsy the correct area. Very good in uh, early stage cervical cancers or uh, late stage precancerous lesions. So something that we do in the, uh, in the hospitals. HPV DNA testing, that's the next step. That is what is being done now quite commonly. And now there's actually a self test at home. It is the future, I think, but we are hoping that it's as accurate. Now here comes the primary prevention. It's very simple. We know the cause. Because we know the cause, there are vaccines. Knowledge of the fact that this, this virus, the, the, the HPV virus, is basically a family of viruses suggests that vaccine actually works on the other uh, subtypes as well that causes cancer. So we know there are about 14 high risk subtypes, the main one being 16, 18, uh, 16, 18, 45, 31. Of course, there's 33, 52, 58 as well, which is now being covered by the nine valent. Uh, Survival cancer vaccine. It is important, it is very important for young ones to do this. It is protecting yourself. Now, the other thing is knowledge of how it progresses. It takes about good, I'm just going to go ahead with this, it takes a good 10 years for cancer to develop from a non cancerous cell. There is some degree of regression in the early pre cancer changes. With a vaccine, we do see that it, it actually works better. But if you don't, the persistence of 16 does cause an increase in the tumor, at which point uh, of progression of pre-cancer, at which point of time the cancer cells break through and then you have invasive cervical cancer. So this takes a 10 years. So if you do your pap smear every two years, you get five chances to actually pick up the cancer. And this is why it's important to get a woman to tell her. And tell her, just because you've done one doesn't mean that that's the end of it. You have to keep on doing it. HPV causes other cancers as well. And with the vaccination, you tend to have protection against them as well. And the safety outcome, there is the, uh, sorry, the next one, 
is a global advisory committee on vaccine safety has concurred with their test that the vaccine is safe and will actually be effective without causing too much damage or increased risk even for pregnant women. So it is safe, it is necessary, it is very, very good. So what I'd like to emphasize is rather than talk to you about treatment and disease, I'm going to talk to you about trying to get you to get the doctors and get patients to actually consider uh, screening a patient, identifying the patients before they have the disease so that they can get a chance to be treated very, very early and to have a more effective treatment regimen. So thank you very much for the presentation. I've got a couple of questions I believe that has come and uh, I'd like to just if, uh, talk to you about this. So why pregnant women have lower chance to get gynecological cancers? Well, one of the things, especially with ovarian cancer, is the fact that we talk about inaccessible ovulation, which means every time you ovulate, your ovary tends to be damaged a little bit. As it's damaged, its repair mechanism can uh, be abnormal. If the repair mechanism is abnormal, you can have changes which result in cancers. The other thing is with lactation, you do have a suppression of estrogen for the time that you are actually breastfeeding, at which point in time the uterus is not uh, exposed to that high estrogen levels. And with cervical cancer, on the other hand, I must say, multivariety does increase the risk because of cervical tissue damage. Birth control pills can reduce ovarian cancer and bone cancer, but increase the risk of breast cancer and cervical cancer. Now, birth control pills tend to be, uh, it, it, it offers the same thing as lactation in the sense that when you're not ovulating, when you're on birth control pills, you do not ovulate, you don't get the damages of the ovarian tissue and certainly the changes in the hormonal, uh, the way the hormones work reduces the estrogen exposure of the, the, the endometrial lining. With cervical cancer, one of the things that we like to tell patients is when you're very comfortable in not getting pregnant, especially in a much younger way, there is a possibility of perhaps having more than one partner. And we know that cervical cancer is caused by HPV. Birth control pills does not prevent HPV from uh, entering the cervical mucosa or the epithelium. And that's one of the most common causes. With breast cancer, unfortunately, with the estrogen and progesterone receptor positive tumors, we do understand that breast cancer, uh, the, the birth control pills are hormone related. So they can sometimes actually increase the uh, stimulation of the receptors in the breast and, and cause an early change. So should I use birth control pills? Uh, it is an individual choice in my opinion. In the sense that if you are worried about actually having not being pregnant, it makes a lot of sense. In the long run, a short term use of anywhere between 3 to 5 years makes a very big uh, difference in the risk of reducing the risk of ovarian cancer. However, there are other health issues associated with birth control pills, especially this one is smoking. If one is a uh, rather large size, which increases the risk of delayed thrombosis and strokes. But yes, I think in the right person, it has a very, uh, very large benefit. So thank you very much, Monsignor.